Okay, so hello. Can we start? Fantastic. So I'm happy that so many of you came here to be convinced that you need time for bug fixes. My name is Kinga Witko and I am a software tester. And I say about myself that I fell in love with agile methodologies. So it won't be purely test related session, but also a bit about agile. I used to test web mobile, a bit of data warehouses. I have experience in different areas, different team sizes. So I think it would be good to grab that experience and share it with you. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, you can also read my blog about uh, software testing, a bit about Agile at kingavitko, kingatestwordpress.com. So this session won't be purely testing. I think it would be fun, I hope it would be fun, we'll try to do some exercises, so be prepared, it won't be just boring listening, I hope. And it would be about bugs, about bug fixes, and what I mean by bug fixes. And bugs, I mean functionalities that have not been correctly done, that have some issues, or are not sufficiently done. So I believe that everyone knows such projects. An inspiration for this talk was this infamous quote. I think that everyone knows at least one person who works or worked in a project that I don't always test my code, but when I do, I do it on production, is not a unique situation, but a standard. So I think we should deal with those bugs and to think about scheduling time for them from the beginning of our projects, not at the end. The plan for the talk is simple. It's based on a project that I had a chance to particip participate in it was a tiny one, but beneficial in experiences. So I will give you some background from that project. We will talk and play around time. And at the end, we'll try to foresee bugs like we real wizards. So let's get it done. At first, the project. Once upon a time, there was a project. Let's call it the Nightmare. Why so ugly name? Well, multiple users, live users, a lot of external services, legacy code, years of bad practices, and really tiny test coverage. It was a marketing platform and on the top of that, us, the team. Together with two other teams, we've been working on that marketing platform for about two years. We've been quite confident about our team relations, about the code base. We knew how to work. We added additional features to the code. It was quite fun. We've been sticking together for uh, some time. And as the result of selling non-existing software, if you know what I mean by our business, we've been informed that as soon as possible, we have to deliver some additional project. So it was a project inside the project. Our resources wasn't truly enough for that stuff, so we gathered additional team members with certain features to deliver that. We've been working on Agile method. I won't call it Scrum, but it wasn't waterfall e either, so let's say Agile. So the team effectively consisted of 10 or 9 people. 
we were doing manual tests, a bit of unit tests, but the test coverage of the cold that we were integrated with was really tiny. And what about this new project? It was supposed to be a marketing platform, shiny, with new shiny front-end. We were not used to that because we did basically back-end. So we had new team members for front-end features. And there was a tricky part. There was a fixed deadline. And what I mean by fixed deadline? We've been informed that we have for all our work a month. And to motivate us, as it was a marketing tool and a marketing campaign, this fixed deadline was advertised in national TV and social media. So it is a hard deadline, isn't it? So how hard could it be? Of course, in such situation, when you have some project description, and if you are a software tester, I think you may predict some trouble in the end. But when you have a project manager who is still asking, is it done yet? It makes you feel better, right? So having that project description and a lot of pressure, we can predict trouble. Little spoiler at the beginning, we delivered that. Of course we did, but with addition of really unnecessary rush and pressure. What's more, when you have such description and very urgent requirements, the issues within a project tend to multiply really rapidly. And I don't talk about pure bugs or some issues, but about additional things that you have to deliver with it within a very short time. And on top of that, when you have a manager who is still coming to you and asking, is it done yet? Is it done yet? You may end up with a lot of unexpected situation that no one is comfortable with. And your fully beautifully estimated tasks that you've been working on since the planning session. You had your task, you had your stories, you estimated that, and you were confident that you will deliver, may transform into nasty bugs. Or worse, the code will work in production, but you will know what's inside and how ugly the code is. So, when time is limited, a temptation appears. I do believe that. Especially in a project manager mindset. They think, I have qualified developers. Like I have senior Java developers. They are so qualified. Though they may be produce bug free code. When we are in a real rush, people will focus and the code will be pure without bugs and with no necessity of bug fixes. Right? And the best of the best, asking people all the time, have you finished? Uh, is it task well estimated or are we finished yet? It's the best thing to do. So, I always tend to remind them and keep on saying that nine women can't make a baby in a month, but they still tend to forget about it or not to think this way. And in such situation, and it all happened in my little project, appear like, for example, let's add more developers to the project, because when we have limited time, when we add more people, they produce the code faster. Or maybe, for example, Let's force people to do the over hours to get it done in time. And of course, constant meetings and asking about status. They are really helpful. So, 
Uh, now question to you. Who likes candies? Hands up. Oh, we have volunteers, fantastic. Round of applause, come here. I need five volunteers. Come on, we'll play a game. Ha <laughs> ha. It won't be scary. We have four. One more volunteer, please. Fantastic, okay. So stand here in line, like stretch yourself between those two boxes, don't touch it. So, fantastic, bravo for them. Thank you very much, there will be candies. So we have our setup for the project. We have our designer who thinks about task and design some wireframes for us. We have a developer who delivers the code. We have a software tester who will test it with pleasure. We have also a DevOps team. We're lucky we have a DevOps team. And we have the environment. And however you call it, it's our production environment. The machine, sorry. <laughs> okay. And gentlemen. And we have tasks. Plenty of them. Our customer wanted us to deliver really a lot of amo large amount of tasks within a month. So what's your task? Your task is to take each of them, each of our little story or development tasks, and go through each of you from one box to another. Each of you has to touch it as you are like designer, developer, tester, and so on. So this each ball has to go through all of your hands to that box. You have 30 seconds for that, and we will see how many tasks are you able to deliver. So wait a second, I'll take my magic clock. So your time starts now. Come on, fast. Let's move those tasks. Hey, we have large, whoa! Let's go! We have a lot of tasks to do. Come on. 10 seconds. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, stop. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> How many tasks do we have? Uh, two, four, six, eight. Twenty-two tasks. Really, a lot. In a lot of them. You're a fantastic group. Sorry. So twenty-two. Fantastic. So now there will be a twist. <laughs> I would like to convince you that you really need time for bug fixes. So there will be definitely a twist. So let's do it again from scratch. OK? So your time starts now. Look, we have bugs. Come on, you have to now fix it. Oh, deliver bugs first. Box first, box are the no, 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 box are important and tasks. Come on, faster, faster. More box, more box appeared. One each time, one each time. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, stop. Oh, no, 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 don't cheat, don't cheat. <laughs> so, how many tasks do we have now? Hmm. Eleven. Half. Okay. <laughs> you can eat, eat the sweets, of course. Come on. Your sweet fun. Come on. There you go. Yes, and for you. There you go. <laughs> and now a really unexpected situation appeared. Our developer got sick. Oh dear. 
you are sick, you have to lie down in a bed. And our project manager thinks, oh, we have an issue. Let's add additional developers. Oh, we had one, so let's add two. I need two more developers here. Hmm? Oh, we have one, bravo. And I need another one developer. Fantastic, thank you very much. As our developers have no idea about the project, no idea about development, and how do we work, you are able to work, each of you, just using one hand. Okay? We have two of them, so it will be faster, for sure. Okay, so we do it again. So your time starts now. Come on, each, each. Yes, you have to touch it. Each of you have to touch it. Faster, faster, faster. Oh, you missed one. You missed one. You have to pick it up. Three, two, one, stop. <laughs> Sorry. Hmm. Oh, nice result, really. Our developers went very well. 16. So not as much as we did, but we still deliver. And one more task. We'll do it again, and there will be a twist. Inside. No. You do it again. You can use both hands. Let's proceed. Your time starts now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh my god, our environment crashed. And we have no access to production. <laughs> Sorry. So, so, so nothing. We are not able to do anything. Yeah, OK. So thank you very much. Round of applause for them. Thank you for your cooperation. Thank you. Fantastic job. Okay, so what was my point? When you do a development, not the development in a rush, whatever you do, whatever project do you have, when you schedule your ideal tasks at the beginning, you may face so many unexpected situations that you're perfect tasks, your perfectly planned software, your perfectly planned service may finally not look exactly as expected. And there is an agile anti-pattern that you are not supposed to estimate bugs. And I don't want you to estimate bugs. I've read a quote uh, some time ago on a blog written by Blo Bob Hartman. He's an agile coach. And he said that bugs may be either minor or infinite. And what he means by that, that when you have a bug in your code and you know how to fix it, this bug would be minor. But when you don't know about the bug, or it's not in your code. The fix might take as well half an hour as a week. So this bug would be an infinite one. Because when you say for an infinite bug, then you fix it within an hour, you lie anyway. Because you don't know the estimation. So I don't want you to estimate bugs. But to save time for fixing it. This is a project management approach. This is the number that is taken from my talks to different project managers, to some project management books, which says that you are supposed to save 20, 30%. And what I mean by saving, 
add to your estimation during your planning session to each development task. And to have this time for all those unexpected situations. And in my opinion, tester is the one who protects this time. And this is the role of the tester during planning session to cool your team members down and the most cool down the fantastic optimistic analysis and estimations of your project managers because their task is to deliver on time. They have to fit in deadline. But when you know what it's, that it's impossible, tester is the one who can say no, stop it. And are we able to foresee some issues at the, be at the beginning? Uh, who of you considers himself to be a developer? Who is a developer on the start of this gathering? Only, okay, we have a developer. Do you have any heavy objects with you? No, F fine. So I'm able to say that your software is never bug free. Even if some developers think it is, it is not. And are we able to predict bugs? ISTQB, I mean the International Software Bo Board would say about some tra traditional bug causes in their old um, documents to the exams that people make mistakes, they have better and worse days, and they tend to make mistakes in the code. But basic on my experience, my project experience, and after talks with different developers, different project managers, I think it is possible to think of some common causes that you are able to predict at the beginning. And if you know that they are there in your situation, in your requirements, in your environment, you can be prepared. So, insufficient analysis, and it will be a different stuff if you produce some website or mobile application and you don't have enough amount of designs of wireframes, or if you are working on a data warehouse and you don't have business analysis, and you, at the same time, make software because you are rushing, it may result with really incorrect estimations or features they would come back to you because the customer would not be satisfied. So that incorrect analysis may result with incorrect estimations of those tasks and rushing at the end. On the other hand, and here I would be basing on my tiny project, integrating with legacy code or writing some additional features and having some additional services integrating with legacy code may cause issues, not even if the, in the code itself, but on the stick of those two. And in my project, we were using an old code in new functionalities because a colleague of mine decided it would be the fastest way. It was not, because such hybrids and at the same time having non-unit tests and little tiny test coverage at all may cause issues in really unexpected areas of your application. At the same time, when you don't have no integration tests, it's really bad. On the other hand, have you ever considered your deployment time during planning session? We had an example here with crashing environment. This is a part of deployment. When you, for example, don't have access to production, because it happens often that we don't have access to production, and we have our best knowledge or best knowledge of our customer, how the environment looks like. In my project, and this is 
embarrassing, we've been thinking that we have the same version of the database. And before the day zero, it happened we don't. And it didn't work this way. My colleagues spent additional two days, I mean two times 24 hours, trying to keep everything the, the way it sh it's supposed to be. We have different database versions. And it happened. So my advice to you, always check and be sure what kind of version do you have? What language do you use? When your environment crashes a lot, and I think it happens also when you produce, for example, mobile application, and you have not very stable environment, this is also an indicator for you to increase your estimations for your tasks. When you deploy things manually, that may cause a lot of issues. If you don't have continuous integration and you don't do things automatically, you add the time for yourself in the end, for sure. So, all of those, maybe some hints for you, if you think you have those before you plan your time for the project, to increase it. And a bunch of advices from me, basing on my experience, basing on some smart people that I was talking to, expect the unexpected. I think that's a good advice for every tester, that unexpected happens. People get sick. There may be some environmental issue. There may be some issue with, for example, power supplies. We had a lot of that during my development. Our team was spread. A part was in Poland, a part was in Ukraine, and there was a constant issue with internet connection, for example. And it was really hard, really demanding. You cannot predict that. No one expects that he will have a power failure at the end of his project, but things happen. So expect the unexpected. And control your time. I think this is a common sense, and it may be obvious, but people in a rush tend to forget about the obvious. Plan your tasks, yes, but control your time from the beginning till the end, not only during the estimation session. And prioritize, because when something unexpected happens, I'm talking about Agile, because I like Agile approach the most, that we deliver at least something. We deliver a milestone and don't focus on distractors. Just the core thing that our customer would be at least happy about. And I think this is the feature that describes each tester. Professional pessimism. Cool your team members down. Doubt the estimations. Because it's your role, even in an agile team, when we have not purely defined software testing role. And some important thing, both for the testers and for developer. You work in your project not to have a technical depth. Think of yourself in the future, refactoring your own code or having session with developer who was written that, or maybe having a code that have been written by somebody else and swearing on that keyboard, why is it done this way? So think of yourself writing a code in an ideal environment and about yourself writing the code in a rush. It's not the same. Last thought. Think of it this way. If you write, for example, automated tests, or you advise as a quality evangelist or something, that your software may be in production, your service may be in production, and people use it. They think 
it's okay. But maybe, maybe you know what's down there, how ugly the coat is, and maybe you cannot sleep at night because it just bothers you. This is my tester's approach, and I don't support that, but I know people do such things. Think of it. Think of yourself and your users. Let me sum up. I believe that we can learn even from the worst project in the world. And my project is the best example of that. Remember, the time matters. I would like you to focus on a time from the beginning till the end and save those 20, 30% of each development task during the planning session. Because when you won't use it and everything would be perfect and you deliver on time, you will have this time to beautify your code, adding additional flavor to the software, whatever you wish. But when something happens, we'll just use it for the bug fixes. So it is a win-win situation, isn't it? Thank you very much for your attention. Do you have any questions? Okay, well, we have to wait for the mic. <laughs> yes. I have a question. Uh, the problem is that we deliver and uh, we spoil people uh, who count on us in this way. Uh, any advice how to um, educate managers that after such a situation they need to do something because uh, I also work for such a project and uh, we delivered but after that many people left the atmosphere in the team was very very bad uh, managers got a bonus we got a tiny bonuses but nothing really happened really changed any advices on such a situation but to edu educate uh, managers to save this time, s to have additional time, how to change it. I have a tricky advice, and maybe I, I shouldn't say that, but the best way to start it is to hide the time, just to overestimate knowing why you are using this time. Not to have vacation for half of the project, but if you know that there will be trouble, just estimate more. Because project manager, in fact, is responsible in front of the customer for the deadline, for delivering. But when you say you cannot do that, or you just can deliver this and that and some, I don't know, three main features, overestimating that, but having in mind that it will be good quality, I think it's a good start to show the result first and after that work with people. Because I have such experiences that when you say, for example, and that's the best, the, the worst approach ever, saying the customer that, uh, no, we cannot do it because we need to write unit tests. Like, customer doesn't care about the unit tests. He doesn't care about testing at all. He wants his fantastic software that he imagined. So I think the, the project manager is more on the customer side. He's not always technical person. So I think it's our case to overestimate in a reasonable way, of course, but to deliver good quality. I, I don't know, maybe I am living in you know, some kind of fairy tale. <laughs> Do you have any more questions? Or did I answer the question? has been in the management books for years, so they know that. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it works. Or change the company. If you don't have a Scrum Master, you will be always pushed by your manager because you wouldn't have a balance. Yes, exactly. So, yeah, it's... Uh, it's a hole. Yeah, it, it also depends about the approach you have. 
Because when you work in an agile and you really have a scrum master and team that is responsible for delivery, it's different. But when you work, when you have like project manager with a stick or something, <laughs> come on, faster. So Thank you once again.
Just like that, no introduction? Okay. Done? Okay, cool. Well, hi guys. Um, so King already, you know, invited you here, so I won't do that. Uh, my presentation is, uh, is this. How I ended up in the Hall of Shame, and, and that's written by me. Uh, so what's the plan for my presentation? It's simple, first I talk, then you talk, and it's vague on purpose because I don't want to spoil what I'm going to talk about. So, um, actually, I, I just said maybe 20 words now, and I already lied once. Um, my presentation is not titled um, How I Ended Up in the Hall of Shame. It's actually titled How I Ended Up in the Hall of Shame Repeatedly, because there, there was more than once. Um, okay, so let's just jump into it. Um, why? Because in every, probably, country and language, there's this saying, smart people learn from uh, their mistakes, which is dumb, because smart people know that committing mistakes is painful and they try to avoid it. So that's a fail, and the better approach is this. Smart people learn from other people's mistakes, and that's precisely why I created this presentation, so that you can learn from my mistakes and you don't have to live through all the shame and, and humiliation. So hopefully, you can learn something and, um, and spare yourself some pain. Okay, so um, who am I? Uh, that's, that's me, that's my face right there. Uh, so uh, I did test automation ever since I, I did any career, <laughs> actually. So that was the, my first task, my first job was to be a tester because back in the day, you could become a tester if you knew how to click and say, yep, the, the pop-up loaded. So um, I started as that kind of a tester, and then I d evolved. So I did front-end, back-end, mobile automation, process automation, continuous delivery, whatever it written there, it's true. Um, I worked with three um, languages, and I did manual testing. I was a test lead, test automation engineer, a scrum master for a few <coughs> projects. I have a QA mentor that sounds like Gandalf, but um, it actually was pretty similar. Um, I did business analysis and I was a community master, which is uh, in big companies, they have a lot of testers and they say, hey, we should gather twice a month and we need someone to organize that. I did that. So I worked in Spain, Israel and Poland and I think um, if you like doing maths in memory, you now sit there and thinking, uh, well, okay, eight years divided by front and back and mobile automation process, whatever it written there, divided by three programming languages, that like six months for every combination. And then Scrum Master and this community, whatever. Um, so am I really an expert on anything? And the question actually is, do you really want to be? So um, if you're an expert, you're the big fish in a small pond. Because usually groups are small. And let's say your group is 10 or 20 people. And you're the local expert, right? So still, the pond is small. And you're the big fish in the small pond. So to exemplify a story. Um, I think I was an expert once, uh, and um, that was in the beginning of my career. I started learning Python, and I liked it, and then there was this big hype about behavior-driven development, so I learned that, and I really liked it. I still think it's a great tool. Um, it's just that, you know, I became the expert, and then I, um, I went to this QA community and said, hey, I can present this, and I did, and they really liked it, so they adapted it. And then suddenly a hundred people were using it. Um, so I was, you know, I felt proud because people came to me and asked me questions and asked for my opinion and for my help or whatever. And it feels good. So, um, yeah, so how did I fail in that? Well, very, in a very short uh, span of time, um, the demand outgrew the supply because I was the only, you know, the, the local expert on, on this. And then when a hundred people uses that, they suddenly need a lot of things you don't need. So, oh, someone needed a different way of passing command line parameters. Someone else needed a different um, reporting plugin. Someone else needed to run it in parallel on some other machines, whatever. So um, I couldn't keep up with all this demand, even though I was doing overtime just to, you know, stay the expert. And um, suddenly there were more local experts. Someone was an expert on this parallel execution. Someone was the expert on something else. So I said, no, 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 no. 
I was the expert, right? So I'll just commit more time and more effort and become the expert. And I did. And the failure in all this is that it got boring. After a while, I, de I dedicated so much time and so much effort to learning this one thing that it just got boring. So I said, well, the company is big, let's just change. But then I realized what was the underlying root cause of this failure. I didn't know anything else. I just knew how to do backend automation following BDD in Python. I didn't know any other programming languages. I didn't know any tools. I didn't do any front-end or mobile automation or anything. So um, it was a huge failure on my, pi my part, and it ended by me becoming a junior, even though by then I think I had three or maybe four years of experience. Um, I became a junior in a different project that used Java just to force myself to be exposed to more tools and more techniques. Um, so the key takeaway from this is that being an expert is good, and it feels good, and, and it is generally good. But remember that learning and becoming an expert is even better. And over-specialization, especially in the beginning of your career, is very, very dangerous. Okay? So, um, another story. 100% automatic test coverage, zero bucks. So, sounds like a failure scenario to you? Well then, let me tell you a story. Um, so, in one of my previous jobs, we did this thing. We wanted to automate everything. So we called it, or maybe it's, it's called in general, continuous delivery. So you want to automate everything so that uh, you don't do like um, bi-weekly or monthly releases. Everything that gets to the master branch on, mm, on your GitHub gets deployed automatically. So to do that, um, we started implementing tests through pull requests. So I uh, was working on BDD again. Um, and I did pull requests with test cases. And that would ensure that they were reviewed by the whole group. And then once this pull request was uh, merged, we had a hook between GitHub and Jenkins. And then we had a script that used the Jira API and created uh, those test cases automatically from the Gherkin feature files. And then once that was done, then um, we got Jira um, IDs. So we had another process that would grab these Jira IDs and then uh, modify the files automatically. And that's, that's how we would track automatic tests and test execution. And then we automated all the tests and then all the deployment was automated as well. Everything was automated, right? So um, how, oh, sorry, too soon. Um, so, uh, how did we fail in all that? Well, the zero bugs, um, it was actually the lead developer who brought this up on a few consecutive um, retrospectives. He said, well, this sprint, there were no bugs. And I was like, well, let me check my um, coverage report. Oh, it's still 100%. Guess there was no bugs, right? Um, so then, the, the next retrospective and the next, and he was like, well, this sprint, there were no bugs. And I was like, hmm, there has to be logic in it. So I started thinking, and I was like, he is right. Developers are not that smart. So I failed. How did I fail? Well, big time. <laughs> I failed big time. So um, actually, I, I got so hyped about all the automation and all the... Um, all the reports and all the green 100% reports and everything that um, I actually changed my approach and my mindset. So I, whenever I read requirements, I didn't review requirements. I just read them and took them as, as if it was a bit the Bible and said, oh, okay, and out of that, I think this and that and that is easy to automate. The rest we can just run once and then forget about it, right? Right, because reports are really... Uh, really in important. So the key takeaway from this is that automatic testing is not a newer, better version of manual testing. There's time and place for both, and they are different. You use automatic testing to help you to reduce the amount of work and time that you need to spend on repetitive tasks. But it's not testing in its own right, because 
to do testing, you actually need to be able to make decisions. And automatic tests can't make decisions. They can make assertions, and that's a big difference. So um, there is a very cool article about that on James Bach's um, blog. So um, there's a link somewhere at the end. Um, so he generally specifies that there are differences between testing and checking. Don't know if you've seen that, but um, what I did was checking. So um, checking can be completely automated. That was my focus, automate everything. It has a definable outcome because if you want to automate it, it has to be definable within some realm. And it requires clear, up-to-date specification. Uh, you need to check against something. You need to have an oracle that tells you whether this test passes or not. And it helps to confirm or deny initial assumptions. So whenever you write uh, an automatic test, you, you don't write test and say, oh, I wonder what the result will be. You actually um, say, OK, this test should pass, and this test should fail. And that's checking. And it's not all bad. It's, um, it's, it's just a tool. It cannot substitute the whole testing, because it's just a part of testing. And testing, what it actually is, is that um, there is this cool term the, that is sapience. So sapience is basically um, being able to make informed decisions from something. And it represents people. So testing cannot be automated fully. It can only be supported by tools. And it's an ongoing investigation that relies on exploration ex and experimentation. And the key to that is the ability to draw conclusions based on what you see and what you expect. And it helps to understand the scope and limitation of the product. It, it doesn't just follow a script like the wireframes or the, the requirement speci uh, specification. It's just testing in itself is reading wireframes and thinking whether the user likes it or not, or will like it or not, or if it's useful, or, or if it doesn't break something that already exists because you're not working from scratch, you're working on something else. So um, it's very, very important to do testing and don't substitute checking for testing. And to reinforce that, there's um, the industry has actually um, came up with names. So if you do checking, you're called a checker. And if you do testing, you're called a tester. So um, now a quick uh, word game. So um, checking and checker. Well, in English, checkers is actually a game. It's a board game. This is checkers. So uh, basically, uh, these would be checkers. So think about it. Whenever you feel like not doing testing, do you really want to be a checker? No, no, you don't. You don't. Uh, OK, so next story, because we don't have time. Um, a lot of bugs found each sprint. So how is that a failure? OK, I'll tell you. Um, so if you ever find yourself in a situation where uh, sprint by sprint, you uh, consistently find a lot of bugs, then probably you failed. Um, and how did you fail? you were acting too late. Because um, I, I really liked it in Kinga's presentation. I didn't see it before, so it was a surprise to me. But this is actually related. Um, that uh, What she said is that you can foresee uh, bugs. And you actually can. So don't wait until everything is implemented and, and you know you can just go and everything is deployed. You can just check it. And then, ah, oh, yeah, there's a bug. So try to act as soon as you can. And um, this is the key takeaway. It's much cheaper to prevent bugs from being implemented than trying to catch them later on. This sounds like a phrase from Pokemon, doesn't it? Try to catch them all. Um, anyways, anyways um, my five, uh, my cheat sheet on how to not act too late. So present the QA perspective to devs and management. Um, and it's, it's not only the um, protect the estimation, I think. It's, it's actually what, what I envision in this, in this point is that the QA perspective is, starts from the very basic idea that even the most complicated project 
doesn't have to be hard to test. It doesn't have to be complicated for a tester. You can usually, when like um, if you do front-end uh, testing or front-end automation, usually the the bane of all front-end um, automation is that you don't have any selectors that you can use because you know there are three buttons and they are called the same and they have no specific ID IDs or anything that's different and then you have to find the three and then say okay mine is the second from the bottom or whatever so um, it's not that developers actually implemented it this way just to spite you. It's that they don't have the QA mindset and they don't care about other testing than unit testing and, and about unit testing only a fraction of them. So you have to make them aware that there is a way to make it easy to test. And, and it's your job. Uh, as a tester to know how to test it and and to tell developers hey it's no effort for you and it's a great help to me just put this ID there so um, present the QA perspective on sprint plannings or meetings or whatever it always raise flags uh, so that people are aware that, that you're not just the bad boy who in the end says no it's not ready for release okay that you actually are a part of the team and to be able to do that, you need to do the, the next two. Familiarize yourself with all design documents. Um, this is key. You have to know your project through and through. So I think that if you are a part of a team and you are the tester in this team, you cannot ever do black box testing. It's not your time and place. If you are a part of the team, you always have to know everything about the project because this knowledge will allow you to spot conflicting requirements. Saying, I don't know, someone wanted a button somewhere else and someone wanted a button somewhere else. And then if you show this button, you can't show the other. You can spot this from only design documents and you can prevent that bug from ever being, you know, implemented and that saves a lot of time a lot of dev time a lot of your time it saves a lot of time to the whole group so um, I deny you the ability to make black box testing if you're part of a test uh, of a team and assume nothing ask about everything uh, if you accumulate enough experience you will tend to jump to conclusions so you say okay um, we're doing backend, and in the backend, if the um, if the request is incorrect, then you usually return a 400 bad request error, and then you specify, hey, this field is incorrect, right? Right, but it's it's not a one fits all situation. Actually, right now I'm working on a project where we use a different component for front end, and this component doesn't understand any response codes other than 200. So if you if you if your backend sends a 400 to front end it redirects to a page saying hey 400 and and there is no way to come back from this page to the, to the main page you have to log out and log in again. So um why why because some other team decided this was the way and and they always return 200 and then in the payload of that request they actually specify what the error was. Why? Because they decided this way. So don't assume don't assume you know if just because you have five or seven or ten years ex experience it's always it's always new and um the next one if you understand code participate in code review so if you have at least a few months experience uh, being a tester you probably found this small cheat sheet that says hey if you want to be a tester you have to um, do boundary testing and then you have to try to put strings where there are numbers and vice versa and you have this small cheat sheet and you and you follow this cheat sheet and then you find bugs um, yeah but if you understand code and you read the code then you can actually check if the developer forgot about including zero in this input because it's, it's right there, it's in the code. You don't need to wait until it's implemented and, and reviewed and then merged and then deployed somewhere and then you say, oh, so the input values are from zero to 99, huh? cheat sheet, minus one, zero, one, 99, 100. Okay, you can do that 
by just looking at code. So if you can and you understand code, participate in code reviews, even if they don't want you to. Um, and then the last one, remember to look at the product from user's perspective. So this sounds um, contrary to what I said before about black box testing, um, but it's actually not. So you can, you can try to forget how it's implemented and look at it from the user's perspective, trying to pretend you don't know. And I think it's much better to know everything and then trying to pretend not to know than to not know anything just for the sake of not knowing and looking from user's perspective, okay? So again, no black box testing if you are a part of the team. Um, okay, I think that's it. If at any point when I was saying that, you said, well, yeah, but the first one sounds like a test lead job and the other two are just like, you know, we have BA, he has to have a job, right? So that's for him and the rest one, why would I ever participate in that? That's, that's for developers. Then you, my friends, are thinking in boxes and that is a massive, massive fail, okay? So, um, another story. <laughs> Thinking in boxes, um, I once w worked in um, a situation where at one point I was the only tester and I started working with six developers. And uh, I think, based on my experience, working with three, maybe four developers um, is okay. Even if you're doing test automation, you have enough time to actually uh, wrap yourself around it. But if you start working with six or more, then you just don't have time for everything. And, and you, you need to start prioritizing what you do and, and basically what you don't do. And in these situations, you might find help where you wouldn't expect to find help. So um, in this particular project, uh, the lead developer said, hey, if you don't have time to do all of that and the customer wants to have at least, I don't know, 60 or 80 or whatever percent of, of test automation, and we can help you. You just need to, you know, tell us how you do it. And I was like, ooh, wait, 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 test automation is my gig, right? I'm the expert on that. So um, I was reluctant at, at first, but then I agreed. I, um, I ran two days of workshops and hackathon and all the team was there, all the front-end and back-end developers, our Scrum Master, even every, everyone was there. And by the end of these two days, they all have automated at least one test. And all in all, you automated a lot. And then uh, half of the developers started developing automated tests, uh, like integrated tests. Uh, just as they were doing development. And sometimes people say that it's an anti-pattern to allow people who implement the, the functionality to do integration tests because they are biased. And it's true, but it's not uh, the whole truth. So basically, the difference between developers and, and testers, uh, apart from skills, is the mindset. The developers want to deliver something, they want to create something, and, and testers want to think about the ways of how this can be used. So if you tell the developers in your team that, hey, try to write uh, tests for that, suddenly you will realize that their mindset is going to change a bit towards testing. And they are going to pay more attention to how they, how they create, how they implement things. And, and the example that I used before, they might start putting these IDs or whatever to the buttons on front end automatically because now they know that to be able to automate that, they need to be able to identify an element. And they just didn't think about it before because no one asked them to. So um, don't think in boxes. In my particular case, um, after this, you know, the initial hype, like, wow, everybody's automating, now I have more time to do, like, you know, the rest of my tasks. And then the lead developer, who is probably the most genius programmer I know to date, <coughs> wrote a pull request that completely refactored my code, and I was like, yeah, that was a really bad idea, now I don't understand anything. And, and I didn't. Um, uh, it took me a week, maybe, reading this code to actually try to understand what he did. And when I did, I, I realized that he did something 
really unexpected. He created so many tools. Uh, how many of you have worked with Protractor or Angular applications? So we worked for, uh, with Protractor there, and what he did was um, he modified Protractor. Uh, he added uh, so there's there's these um, there's this method called uh, wait for Angular. So basically. Node.js is asynchronous and uh, front-end testing is synchronous. So there's um, a big discrepancy between the two, but you can use it because Protractor is an overlay on Selenium and it has something that's called a control flow. And this control flow makes Protractor synchronous even though it's asynchronous. Um, and to do that, he has this method called wait for Angular. So it waits for the Angular Digest loop, and what he did was he introduced uh, screen capture in that, and automatically we had um, execution like videos. It would just grab uh, a screen um, capture every time that we issued any uh, decision, uh, uh, sorry, any um, call through Selenium, and then we would just merge it into a GIF file, and we would have proof or report for the test execution that would allow us to, to um, debug or see what was uh, visible when the test failed. And it was just one thing. Then he wrote something that serialized uh, JavaScript code. So if you are familiar with Selenium, you know that there's this function execute script that you can just pass something and it's executed in the browser directly. So um, he went one step further and then uh, we could use normal code instead of writing it uh, as a script, as a string to for this function. We could just write normal JavaScript code and it would serialize everything and then it would grab a stack trace from the, the browser if uh, if it failed. And uh, this one change allowed to speed up by like tenfold every call that needed more than one element. Just like, you know, two changes from the top of my head. And he made a lot. So in the long run, not only did the developers start committing less errors because now they had a fraction of, of the tester mindset. I became a better tester because I better, like, I learned how to prioritize and, and organize my time. And I became a better programmer because you become a better programmer when you read good code. So don't think in boxes. You can find help uh, or motivation in, in unexpected areas. And this actually goes back to being the biggest fish in the small pond. Like, if you're the only tester in your group, you are the biggest fish in the, in the, in, in the small pond. You just, you just won. You have no one to look up to in your team, in your immediate vicinity. And, and this hinders your progress. Because if there was someone else, someone more experienced than you, you could learn from that person. And, uh, and if you're just yourself, then, then you're just stuck with whatever you can find on Stack uh, Overflow, right? Right, so don't think in boxes. Um, and remember, delivering a project is a group effort. So stop thinking in terms of me, my, mine, and start thinking of we, our, ours. It's a group effort. Okay, I don't remember what was the next one. Let's see. Oh yeah, the hall of shame. <laughs> oh, the hall of shame. So this is um, a failure that actually gave name to my um, to my presentation. And the uh, story of uh, the Hall of Shame is short and sad. So um, there was this uh, scrum board where we used to put um, post-its on before we discovered Jira. And then it was just you know left in the corner, gathering dust. And then suddenly, my friend, whose name is Alvaro, he went there to the corner, he brought it, he de-dusted the, the board, and then put uh, a piece of paper on it with this code. <coughs> okay, so you might not see clearly the code, but um, it says there, uh, public void, close the mysterious dialog. Uh, there's a try catch that tries to find the mysterious dialog close button element, and then uh, if there is no such thing, it's, uh, it just does nothing. So just for, for people that don't know Java, this, th there's like five lines of code, maybe three, and there are at least three huge anti-patterns that, that are anti-patterns in all programming languages. You shouldn't use try-catch 
as a branching mechanism in your application ever. And then if you do use it, you shouldn't hide the exception, which I do because I don't do anything with the exception once it caught. So um, anyways, this, this was a massive failure. So why did I do that? Well, that was back in a day where testers were the second category citizens and they were like well project manager says developers um, say it works so you know fix your test because it works right right um, so I did that um, there was a test that was failing uh, if you did it manually it would work and if you did it automatically it wouldn't work so um, what was the, the root cause? Well, in the middle of the screen, there was an invisible dialog, and this invisible dialog hid the lower part of a button. So if you try to click something with Selenium, it clicks in the center of the element. And the center of the element was just at the edge of the dialog, and then it wouldn't work. But if you did it manually, and you clicked over the half of the button, it would actually work. So every time, I went there and did it manually. I would just click, and then if it didn't register, I wouldn't think, oh, maybe there's a mysterious invisible dialog, right? I would just say, mm, maybe, you know, the mouse didn't register the click or whatever. Uh, so I would click again, and fortunately or unfortunately, I would click in the, in the upper half. It would work. I was like, oh, this test is flaky. I need to switch it off or, you know, amend it. And then I found it. I found it after weeks <laughs> of, of fighting for it, and then I needed to fix it on my end, even though it was a bug. Um, so th this was a massive failure on my part, and now after all my experience, uh, I can tell you what to do in these situations. So um, in this situation, what you do is you go here, you grab your poking stick, you then <coughs> go to the developer that works with you and you start poking, right? And this is very important. You have to go to a developer that works with you because you don't want to poke someone else. So you go there and you say, hey, developer, there's a mysterious invisible dialogue in the center of the screen, fix it. And then developers are generally stupid, I mean, slow. So <laughs> he will probably say something like, well, a dialogue? I, I don't see anything because it's invisible. <laughs> and then you just stand your ground until it's fixed. Because I, I, just, I did all this cutscene just for you to understand that your tests can fail. And it's OK if they fail when they detect real bugs. So I give you permission to not fix your bugs because, oh, someone else said that it worked or manually it works or anything. If it is a real bug, just make the test fail and, and make this one red dot in the report just sting their eyes until they say, okay, developer, just fix it. Okay? So it's okay for your tests to fail. Okay. Ah, that's, uh, we're done. So, <laughs> any questions? Thank you very much. <coughs> <coughs> Yes. Uh, thanks for a great presentation, a lot of good examples. Uh, however, uh, I can't quite agree with one of them. Yes. Uh, the one where you're saying that uh, white box testing is, is a good thing and black box uh, is not really what you need. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, <coughs> people minds are biased. So mm -hmm. uh, if you're a single QA on the project. I mean, I if there are many of them, then probably it, uh, it's wise to combine, to have some people who are doing white box and are well aware of product structure, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and others are carefully isolated and doing as a black box. But if you're a single developer, uh, oh, sorry, single QA, uh, I would say that doing only white box uh makes it harder for you to put yourself on client's position uh, you can't forget what you already know and you can can easily um, miss something so i, I would say that uh, doing black box <coughs> if you're a single uh, tester on a project is is much wiser i strongly disagree so um <coughs> that's good if if um if you have a bigger group then i think you're right um i would uh, i would consider 
some people to be like separated and they can do more usability testing or um, they, they can try to act as customers. But if you are the only tester in the group, then if you do only black box testing, the whole, the rest of the group is going to see you as a hindrance because you are just going to say, okay, I, I, I think this, I don't know, this layout is a bug. Why? Why? Because you think so. Because I think it's not usable or it's, it's too hard to, uh, to understand. But maybe that was actually the requirement. What if it's implemented as specified? Then it's not a bug. You have just found an improvement. So um, I think that if you are the, the only, like the one tester in a group, you shouldn't do black box testing because because you can invite someone else you can you can have a hackathon for two days with your colleague who does something else and he's actually going to not know anything about your project so he can do black box testing for you but you as the only tester in the group you are much i i think your value for the group is much bigger if you can do all the other things if you can review requirements, if you can spot the bugs uh, in requirements or discrepancies between what, what you think uh, or w what is implemented and what should be implemented. And you can only do that when you have enough knowledge about the project. So I think that uh, the value and the benefits of you knowing being the, the single QA is much higher than you not knowing and having the client's perspective. Um, okay, thanks. I, I have objections, but let's discuss later. Let's not okay, <laughs> thank you. More questions? Oh, come on. Well, then, thank you. <coughs> <coughs> All right. I'll do that.